So how do we train spiking neural networks? Turns out that's a tough question. There have been a lot of papers lately um, proposing a lot of different algorithms. I think I can say that this is also starting to see a lot more interest as more and more people start to kind of think that spiking neural networks might be a very important next frontier for machine learning, we have started to look a lot more into efficient ways to train spiking neural networks. One of the problems is there's not necessarily an obvious way to do it. Um, there is not specifically necessarily a good way to do a gradient-based rule, right? So with artificial neural networks of the kind that we've been using, you can get an error signal, right? And then you can sort of descend the gradient of that error. You can use that information to speed up training, right? To train efficiently, I should say. It's not obvious how to do error and gradient-based training like that with an artificial neural network. Or, I'm sorry, with a spiking neural network. Ah. Because it's not it's not easy to define like derivative of something with respect to error, right? That becomes the big problem, is trying to define d thing, d error in a practically computable way. So far, there are a few common answers to this question, right? Um, we can convert, so we can train a normal artificial neural network and convert it. There are a couple of backpropagation like schemes that have been um, proposed. And then there are local rules, right? And here is a sort of paper that includes an overview of some of this. And local rule here means at the synapse, right? Using local information at the synapse, which basically is going to end up meaning spike timing dependent plasticity, but we'll see. So conversion for my money is one of the least interesting proposals. It is basically um, train a normal not spiking neural network and then convert it, right? Then just basically map those neurons onto spiking neurons, map those units onto spiking neurons, map those weights onto synapse weights and just use that, right? Um, this works. This actually can work fairly effectively for a lot of problems, which might be interesting if you thought about it. Like, I guess might be interesting theoretically or philosophically, right? Um, it might be encouraging that, that sort of ANNs aren't completely off base. Um, but it also limits the kind of architectures that you can have, right? In my opinion, one of the potential strengths of spiking neural networks is that they can have sort of very complicated, you know, connection patterns, right? And if you convert a normal ANN, you lose a lot of that. Another problem is that these are not very good at learning temporal codes, right? These tend to handle rate codes, but not temporal codes, which we might suspect means we're throwing away a good part of the sort of represent, representational power, the ability of our network to represent things, right? The computational power that it might have. Um, this also can involve things, I mean, again, I'm, I maybe shouldn't talk out of my area, but these also can involve a lot of very bizarre schemes that seem to me to not be very efficient or to waste a lot of the potential power of a spiking network. So a lot of the... Um, Oh, right. So um, a lot of them kind of involve or all right. a lot of them involve showing a static input to a spiking network for several time steps to get an output, which seems sort of like not the point. Right. We already have like that's not the problem that an SNN is meant to solve. Right. We already have very good not time aware networks that solve that not time aware problem. So I kind of don't get the point. Um, so then there are backprop-like rules, right? So there have been a couple of algorithms proposed that basically do try to find a way to kind of carry information back from an output layer to previous layers, like to previous neurons, in a kind of backpropagation-like scheme. One of them that was mentioned in the paper I linked before sort of ignored the spike, basically. It dropped the spiking bit and it just sort of tried to take the derivative of the, you know, not spiking voltage and treat that like an activation and do something backprop-like, backprop-like. There are a few other schemes that, again, in my opinion, are, are kind of weird and I don't think really sort of are the way you'd want to use a spiking neural network. Some schemes, for example, ignore, like, 
they just sort of track which output neuron spikes first, basically. And so they have these kind of first to spike rules. And that, again, seems kind of weird to me as a way to use one of these. But these two are not very good at temporal encoding, right? And they are not biologically plausible, right? So, and you, you can decide how much you care about that, right? If we're doing machine learning, then just being biological, biologically plausible matter, no. But we do have sort of a very good reason to think that the brain does not have any kind of error backprop-like channel, and yet your and my or my dog's or my cat's brains are still able to learn, right, complicated sort of rules and behaviors without needing it, right? So it, it's, it's a question to ask, right, if the brain doesn't include this, it, like why are we, well. <laughs> yeah, so it, I guess it's a question to ask that if nature didn't see the need for this, why do we? I'll phrase it that way. Ooh. And then there are local rules. Um, so again, local rule here means rules that use the information at synapses um, without any kind of well, that's okay, so that's actually not going to be entirely true, right? But without backpropagation like behavior, right? And by that, we basically mean spike timing dependent plasticity, right? Which we're going to talk about in a minute. It is a learning rule based on spike timing, right? This is very biologically plausible, but it's expensive and it's not always clear how to do it well, right? Um, it gets into reinforcement learning, which means that you have to sort of let your, your network spend a lot of time experimenting with the environment, right? You have to simulate it for a lot of time. You have to sort of have a mechanism that makes it experiment with different activities so that it can kind of, um, well, you have an exploration trade-off, right? You, you want to sort of force your network to generate interesting output so that it can potentially find uh, behaviors and spike patterns that work and then learn those, right? And that is very, very expensive. And I think I can say that we don't have a great way to do that very time efficiently yet. So spike timing dependent plasticity is a rule for adjusting synapse efficiency um, slash connection weights. It is a form of heavy in learning right, which is sort of the motto or moniker that neurons that fire together wire together. Um, it is a sort of specific Hebbian scheme, right? So yeah, the Heb postulate is I think 40s and then spike timing dependent plasticity is 80s or 90s, I forget. Um, we can kind of think of it as being an unsupervised learning rule, right? Spike timing dependent plasticity is sort of about neurons um, learning to associate with other neurons right and sort of not having an explicit error signal but just learning pattern recognition if you will right learning to associate certain outputs with certain inputs so that certain higher level neurons get associated ideally with lower level features right so it's kind of like unsupervised learning or feature detection sort of all right and the the basic form of it is if you have a Post, so postsynaptic neuron is the one after, right? So if you've got, you know, neuron A, neuron B, and draw us a little axon, a little, yeah, right? Spikes are going from A to B, right? Oh, here's a much better picture, right? So um, if the presynaptic neuron, which is the one emitting the spike, fires be just before the postsynaptic, right? Or if the postsynaptic neuron fires just after the presynaptic, then we strengthen that connection because they're probably related, right? If the presynaptic neuron fires and the postsynaptic neuron fires, they were probably related. Whatever this thing is detecting or associated with is probably related to what this thing is associated with or detecting. If the postsynaptic neuron fires just before the presynaptic neuron, right? then we assume that they're like anti-correlated, right? They're unrelated. Whatever the presynaptic neuron is computing is not important to the postsynaptic neuron, so we weaken the connection. And that's what you're seeing down here, right? So LTP is long-term potentiation, and LTD is long-term, oh, is it depression? I'm blanking. Um, and basically, the narrower that little time gap is, right? 
if the presynaptic neuron fires just before the postsynaptic neuron, we strengthen them a lot. And then, if the presynaptic neuron fires just after the postsynaptic neuron, we weaken them a lot, and then it starts going down again, right? So if the postsynaptic neuron, if the postsynaptic neuron fires way before the presynaptic neuron, we, we kind of do nothing, right? We're outside of the window there. So STDP is sort of, kind of, an unlabeled learning rule, right? We would like to have a way to, you know, introduce, um, I guess, oh, I don't know if labeled data is exactly the right term, right? We would like to have a way to do more than just pattern recognition, right, in association. So um, basically, we have reward modulation. And I might relabel this slide reward modulation that is based on the way that dopamine, or I should say one candidate model for how dopamine works in the brain, right? So loosely speaking, instead of applying the spike timing dependent plasticity update immediately with reward modulation we update so we store those as tags if you will on the synapse and then we update them we multiply them by the presence of a reward signal right so if the reward signal is low we do not update the synapse strengths we assume that our network is not doing something useful that it needs to learn to repeat that it needs to remember if the reward signal is high then we allow those timing, so those timing-based coincidence tags to update the, net, the synapse weights, right? We assume that the behavior the network just showed is good, and we sort of allow it to remember and tend more towards that, right? This gives us a way to introduce a reward signal and apply reinforcement learning to our network, which unfortunately is computationally expensive, right? and has some other concerns, right? But is potentially a much more biological, sort of reasonable model for how brains, how neurons learn, right? And that is basically that. <coughs> I'm kind of sorry that we're not gonna get to a simulation or useful code. Um, like I say, I kind of just decided we didn't have the time to do it. I hope this was useful and or interesting. <laughs> And I, th I think it's fair to say that we're not going to have a homework on this, right? What could I possibly ask you to do in a homework? <laughs>